Next up, we have Francesco and Ida from Zondax. Zondax have been working on adding support for shielded transactions to hardware wallets, specifically the Ledger wallet. Um, this, as you can imagine, isn't a particular trivial exercise. Uh, and they're here to talk about how that project and how that work is going. So please give a warm welcome to Francesco and Ida from Zondax. Thanks for the introduction, um, and hi everyone. So before going into the details of the work that we did, I'll um, briefly explain what a hardware wallet is and what it aims to achieve, even though most of you probably already know, just so that we're all on the same page. So a hardware wallet is one of these like physical devices that you can see in the top right hand corner of the screen. They're like small USB sticks that you plug into your computer and you use to sign transactions. So the aim of a hardware wallet is to secure your funds under the assumption that the host computer would be compromised by malware. Now, if malware infects your host computer, it can uh, view all user actions on the computer. It can manipulate the display. So it could, for instance, uh, display a an account number that you would like to send the funds to instead of a fake account number which would be in the transaction. Um, and it can also um, capture a keystroke so it can sniff passwords and um, it can download files and potentially like steal secret keys. Um, so the hardware wallet aims to counter these risks. So first of all, um, it offers a, um, in like keys are stored on the hardware wallet. They're, they're generated on the hardware wallet and you can't extract them from the hardware wallet. They never leave the hardware wallet. So, um, uh, so you have this safety that you can't have the secret keys that are used for signing. The, they won't be stolen. <laughs> and, um, <coughs> And then, um, as I mentioned before, the display of the, uh, of the host computer is not secure. It's not trusted because, you're, because the, if it's infected by malware, the, the um, adversary could display malicious information. Um, whereas the screen of the ledge device is considered as a trustworthy display. So anything that you see on the screen is what is really happening. So what you see is what you sign. Okay, so this kind of motivates like the fact that in terms of security, it's definitely like an improvement if we can process um, like shielded transactions with a ledger because we have this increased security. And so it motivates the design of a um, ledger app for uh, Z, Z like shielded transactions. And um, indeed, like as early as Zcon 1, uh, Jack Grigg had wanted to um, demo using um, a ledger to perform a shielded transaction. And he did, um, but the he was only able to get the, um, he was only able to get the ledger to blindly sign, sign signatures. So the ledger would sign the signatures, but in a blind way. So what is a blind signing in the case of ledgers? I mean, hardware wallets. So the hardware wallet signs the transaction, but it doesn't actually display any information on the uh, device screen for you to check. So. Your keys are safe, they still never leave the device, and so you don't, you're not at any risk of your keys being stolen. But on the other hand, you could still be tricked into signing a malicious transaction, because all the information that you see is what's displayed on the host machine, and as we saw before, the display of the host machine could be compromised. So there's room for improvement, and um, since Zondax 
has developed many ledger apps, we were contacted to um, solve this issue. Okay, so what's the main problem when uh, developing a ledger app for shielded transaction? Basically, um, hardware wallets have very limited um, memory and uh, computational power. If you think of like a transparent transaction, the process between the host computer and the ledger is very straightforward. You just send the host computer, sends the transaction to be signed to the ledger, and the ledger just has to pass this data in order to extract the amount that's going to be spent and the address to which it's going to be spent. It displays this important information to the user, the user accepts, and uh, at that point, the ledger will sign your transaction and send it back, and that can be sent off to the chain. So that's easy. With shielded transactions, things are much more complicated because, I mean, first of all, in order to just know the account balance, you need to decrypt a large number of messages that are on chain. And also, since um, the since the shielded transactions are encrypted, in order to ensure that people are acting correctly, you need to also add zero knowledge proofs to the transactions. And the ledger devices are just not sufficiently powerful or they don't have sufficient memory to either decrypt large amounts of messages on chain or perform these zero knowledge proofs. So in order to um, be able to have shielded transactions in the ledger, we need to delegate some of the key material uh, for decryption and proof generation to the host. So in particular, um, by delegating this uh, decryption, the decryption keys to the host, the host can decrypt the on-chain messages and get the account balance. And um, by delegating the proof generation keys, we allow the host to um, compute the zero knowledge proofs that will be included in the shielded transactions. What's important though is that even though the host has um, these keys which allow it to compute zero knowledge proofs, it never has access to um, the signing key which authorizes the spend. So the host will compute these zero knowledge proofs and include them in the shielded transaction, but the ledger will still verify the shielded transaction before signing it and authorizing the spends. So uh, I'll try and give an explanation I mean, I'll give a high-level explanation of the workflow that goes on between the host and the hardware wallet um, when we want to send a transaction. So first of all, a user will enter in the host machine the details of the transaction that it wants to spend. So um, the amount that it wants to spend and who it's going to send it to. Um, and from this data, the host machine will create an initial transaction blob which contains this information and other information like outgoing viewing keys and things like that. This information is sent in the clear, so not encrypted, to uh, the ledger hardware wallet. And um, since this information is not encrypted, the ledger can just can check this data, store it in its flash memory, and show the relevant inputs on screen for the user to validate. So at this point, the user clicks presumably okay if all is well. And upon user validation, the ledger hardware wallet um, says to the host, everything is good so far. And this gives the host the green light to start building um, the transaction and the zero knowledge proofs. Now, at this point, um, the host doesn't have enough information to build the shielded transaction. It needs to request some information from the ledger hardware wallet. So, um, in order to spend notes that um, it had previously received, and so to compute shielded spends, one needs, among other things, to um, commit to the value being spent and prove in zero knowledge that um, the amount in this commitment is um, actually like what it should be. Um, and so, the ledger is going to provide the randomness used to compute commitments so that later on, 
when it receives these commitments, it can recompute the commitment from the information that it had stored in Flash and be sure that the value in the commitment is indeed what um, the user accepted to spend. The host also gets from the Ledger hardware wallet the proof generation keys in order to compute the zero knowledge proofs. Then, in order to compute shielded outputs, um, the ledger is going to provide uh, randomness for commitments, again, for the same reason, and the randomness which is used to generate the encryption key. Um, and so, once again, this will allow the hardware wallet to recompute um, information, I mean, these values from the information it had stored in Flash and this randomness and check that what the host does is correct. So once the host has got all this extra information from the ledger, um, it can compute the final shielded transaction and create this transaction data blob, which is sent over to the ledger hardware wallet. And now the ledger, as I explained before, recomputes the values to check that the data is consistent with the initial transaction data. If so, it gathers the signatures which are required to spend the funds and it sends these signatures back to the host for these to be sent on chain to be processed. So that's generally the workflow. So we have this kind of hybrid solution which uh, delegates like the heavy duty work to the host. But as I mentioned earlier, like the memory of these hardware wallets is very limited, especially that of the Nano S. It only has 320 kilobytes of memory. And so even though we delegate the most heavy stuff to the host, fitting the Ledger app in the Nano S was like really challenging. Um, it required a lot of tricks and sort of like clever packing of information to be able to get it all working. And then with every um, firmware update of the SDK, we'd be like poking out of it and we'd get like buffer overflows, things would go wrong and we'd have to fix everything to get it all back fitting into the Ledger S, into the Nano S Ledger. So um, since the Nano S Plus came out, which has like five times the memory, we decided to stop supporting this app on the Nano S because it's just like too difficult. <laughs> I mean, it's a lot of maintain. So despite this like fairly recent change to stop supporting uh, the Ledger Nano S, this um, Ledger app was actually ready a year ago. Um, and so you might ask, if it was ready a year ago, then why are we hearing about it now? Why did we not like integrate it into um, Chain like a year ago? Well, that's because even though this um, Ledger app was ready to be integrated a year ago, there was no integration. So usually um, what we, one would use um, a web browser in order to do this integration but web browsers aren't currently capable of doing the zero knowledge proofs that we need to do. Um, so we actually need a desktop application to be able to do this integration. And um, so even though the app was ready a year ago, we had no way of integrating it, so our app started getting a bit old whilst um, the firmware of the ledger kept updating and so did Zcash. Until like fairly recently, um, we agreed to take up integration and um, so that also implied brushing up the ledger app so that everything would work and this is where Francesco takes over because he did most of the work on um, this integration. Okay. okay. Hi. I'm Francesco, and I'm the person that has done most of the integration with the, from, with the app and the wallet. So the idea was to have, in, to, to integrate, as Ida was saying, a wallet with the app. In this case, it was going to be the Zec Wallet Lite. And on paper, this sounds easy, right? Just one plus one is two. But you know, as we'll see later, it wasn't really the case. We had a lot of challenges. and 
obstacles that we weren't quite ready to tackle, and as we'll see in the talk. So we started the integration by forking the code base of the wallet before the Network Upgrade 5 rolled out, and this will be important later, but without going too, many into the, too much into the details of the Rust integration, what we, what we can think of it as we take a laptop, which usually has a CPU solder to it, and we unsolder it, modify the laptop so that you can put the CPU back or another CPU without soldering anything, which it's kind of complicated, but still it worked out and we have the integration. But the first objective on the integration was to retrieve an address, at least to, at first so that the app and the wallet would talk together. After we got that part, would be sending a transaction because what can we do with the received funds if we can spend them, right? But it wasn't that easy. But before we get to that point, we had other issues uh, with the testing, in particular. To our knowledge, we couldn't find a publicly available testnet Light Wallet D server. If you're not aware what Light Wallet D is, service used by Zek Wallet Light to sync more easily with the chain. And the Docker Compose setup present on the repo wasn't exactly working for me, at least on my machine, and there were some parts that were outdated. But Emmanuel, which you have actually seen earlier, uh, in the slide with the pictures, actually helped me out a lot. He set up the Zcash D node and the Light Wallet D node on our infrastructure. But after looking at it, we should have foresaw some things coming. For example, we misconfigured some services. Uh, we were lacking some flags here and there. And also what that meant mostly, the most annoying part I would say, is that at each time we wanted to change a configuration, we would need to restart everything like restart the nodes, and that would mean we lost all the blocks that we synced so far. And syncing the node from scratch took, I would say, at least, at least five hours. So it wasn't exactly the easiest thing to deal with, but eventually, after our third time, we learned our lesson. We had persi persistency set up for syncing and keeping the data working, and that was okay. But then we had issues with the version because we had the Zcash D node that supported Network Update 5, the Actuality D server that didn't, and so they couldn't sync together, there were issues, and after we tried to upgrade Actuality D, we, did, we had issues with the client. So, th is it time for up to, to support Upgrade 5? Actually, it wasn't, we will see later, but with all these obstacles, it really we really thought it was time, because again, we upgraded something, something else that depended on it broke, and it was just a mess. We couldn't, we didn't see where we could continue, and we thought that we had to restart the integration from zero because there were a lot of changes on the wallet that made a lot of work done so far obsolete. And if we did support upgrade five completely, it would, need, we, it would mean we would need to support Orchard also completely. And doing that would mean having to update the Ledger app in a very big way, because currently we don't support Orchard, but in the future, who knows? Git was very crucial crucial to, this, to, to allow this to happen, uh, in particular, the Cherry Pick utility. So I got the commits that were necessary to have the client to work with the server without having to scrap everything. And since we could update the services, and our fork worked with an updated services, we could finally sync the chain. And this actually managed to salvage about 95% of the integration work done so far, which was a huge, huge help. But still, we, we don't have support for Orchard on the Ledger device for now. So now we, the wallet reported sync successful, we can see the balance, we can see that it's spendable. So now we have an even playing field to test out our transaction and pretend we are rich with testnet tokens. But another step, another, another fall was in the way. We, had, we started to have the node rejecting our transactions, both transparent transactions and shielded transactions. We had these two errors, which I couldn't find a, a clear explanation online. I mean, there were some explanations, but they didn't really say, of course, like, oh, the error is right here on this line. 
still we managed to figure out in the end. But when these issues were happening, it was July 30, and it's very close to now. So we were in a bit of a difficult situation. But I, we investigated how the transparent, transparent signatures were working, and in the zip 244, I think, is the one that uh, rolled out the Orchard upgrade. And the sig hash that is used to make the signature for the transactions was slightly changed. Well, the personalization was slightly changed. It, it uses it, it, it changed the name and also the branch ID was updated to Orchard. And we had the previous one, so we needed to update that one and use the right one. But finally, after we did this, the node actually accepted the transaction. And now it's time to tackle the sapling signatures because if we couldn't send sapling signatures, what was the point of the app? But as you saw, the deadline was very, very close. I mean, it was barely a week ago, and we didn't have any more leads to investigate. We already looked very deeply into the SIG hash, all the different parts, it, everything matched. Everything was the same as it would have been without our integration, but still, we had this error with the node. So we had to investigate and narrow down what part was failing and where, and figure that I, I, we tried to investigate the binding signature at first, which is a necessary signature, but that was okay because we could, the outputs were working, so we could have a shielded output, but not a shielded input. So we eventually figured out that it's in the spend. So the next step is to reproduce the failure locally instead of with the node, so we can add logging and narrow down the exact, the exact line. And at that point, this monstrosity appeared. I have no idea to this day Kinda, I kind of know now what it actually means, but the first time I saw it, I had the same understanding of it as a, I think, a seventh grader. I just see a bunch of multiplication and addition. But I was rescued by Ida, and she explained to me that it was actually the signature verification math. So I was, after that, it became clear that there was a problem with the signature. But we already verified that the signature was correct. Everything matched with what we expected, what was the, what the um, previous code was doing, the same, everything was the same. So what else could it be? So we tried to investigate how the red job job signature was done in the ledger and um, the, from the code that we had previously, and we found this section. So in this section, we prepare some data to sign, and we can see that the, the first 32 bytes uh, is the public is the public key part of the signature, and then the second part is the sig hash. But beforehand, in the ledger, and what we thought was right was only the sig hash. So this could have been a very interesting thing to investigate, and that's what we did. We but we tried eventually to figure out in the specification where this was supposed to happen by looking at the zika specification, but. We couldn't find anything, or at least it's there, just not extremely obvious, it doesn't jump out. So maybe that's why we didn't do it in the ledger. But we also tried to look where that part was in the code, because at some point it had to be there, and looking at the Git history, it seemed to have been at least three years. So we can say it's been there forever. So we tried to patch the app, we, we had, had the public key before the C cache, and eventually, we, get, uh, we also patch the verification code on, our, on the client side, and we have a transaction that works. We are able to send a sampling signature with, uh, sorry, a sampling transaction with trans uh, shielded inputs, in this case to a transparent output, but it works the same with a shielded output. So as you can see from the date, it was August 2. It was uh, pretty close to, day, to today, but you know, I, I, I wouldn't be here if it didn't work. So, we have something else for you. We have a live demo. It's something that every, top, every speaker always fears because everything can go wrong in our live demo. So, what you can see on the screen is Zach Wallet Lite with our changes. We can connect to the ledger, which is connected via USB. And now it doesn't work. <laughs> OK.
Okay. When you connect, you can input a wallet birthday, but we have set up some other stuff, so we can just put zero, which is the block height. And now it's gonna request to the ledger something, but in this case it's empty, so nothing will happen. So we can start the wallet, it's gonna sync to the latest block, and this is how we are now. So how do you actually use the Zach Wallet Lite with the Ledger app? You first go towards receive to generate your address, and this is gonna take some time, around 30 to 45 seconds. The Ledger has to generate a couple of things, the incoming viewing key, the default diversifier to get the payment address, and also the outgoing viewing key. This is useful because the wallet will actually request it multiple times, so we do it at this step, which is part of the generation, so everything is smoother afterwards. So this is gonna take about 30 seconds. As to why, well, Ida was explaining that the ledger is slow, but the main thing that takes time is actually the generation itself, because unlike other curves or, and other systems to generate private key and private data, the, the Zcash stuff like RedJubJub and everything isn't part of the SDK. So it basically it's emulated in software, which is slower in our case, and it's tangibly slower. Like it takes a good time. But now we have our address and we still have zero funds. Why that is? Well, that's because we haven't rescanned every block from the birthday of the wallet. So to, to do that, we go up to wallet and then we hit rescan. This will, will have the wallet check every block and see if there's data for the ledger. In this case, it found something and it's gonna ask the ledger to provide a nullifier for the note to see if it's spent. And now we have our funds. Now we should want to send our funds, right? Otherwise, we are still at the initial integration step. So we head over to send and we can paste an address, but in our case, we already prepared the address in the address book. Ledger one is the one we just generated, so we're gonna send to ledger two. And now we can put an amount, whatever we want, as long as it's available in the spendable funds. The only caveat of this is that we can only do up to five spends or five outputs to the ledger. Uh, that's because the memory of the ledger is limited, but in this case, there's just one node, so we can send any amount. In the memo, let's do test for Zcon 2022. And now we'll send. Now, if you remember what Ida was talking about earlier, what's gonna happen is that the wallet sends an initial blob to the, to the ledger, which we, we wanted to display also what's on the ledger screen, but we couldn't for today. Maybe in the future we'll release a video. There's already one on YouTube that goes through the steps, but for now it's like that. It's gonna ask, it's gonna tell you from what address the money is coming from, how much, where it's going, how much is the fee, and also if there is a certain type of memo. In this case, it's gonna say custom because it don't display the whole thing and then you can accept or reject. In this case, Ida has probably accepted, otherwise it would error out already. But now we are here for around a minute and a half. That's how long it takes for the ledger to create all the necessary data, as Ida was talking about earlier, and sign everything, generate the randomness, and verify that everything works great. So after that's done, well, we'll see later, we're gonna get a transaction ID, and we're gonna be able to inspect the transaction with a testnet explorer. And unfortunately the time is like, it's a bit slow. Um, I tested it earlier with five spans, so that would mean five proofs, five signatures, and that took around seven minutes. It's not great, but compared to the Nano S, which was seven minutes for one spend, it's a seven time increase in speed, which is much more usable than it was before. So in this case, we're gonna be done, we are almost be done. And while this process goes on the screen, it will show like step one out of five, two, three, four, and then five, finally. It should be done. And now we have broadcasted our transactions. Transaction. So now we have the transaction ID, we can copy it or check it later. It's gonna be displayed in the, in the transaction sections of the wallet. But this should be, already known if you are already using the wallet. 
you see earlier we had a test transaction and that's our transaction that we sent right now. So if we inspect it, we can see there's a, a section to view the transaction ID on an explorer. It's gonna open a page and it's gonna show that it's unconfirmed, but it's there, it's on chain. So that's it for the demo. I hope you have many questions and we'll be here to answer them. We can always talk to later if you wish also. And that's it for now. Any questions? I need to check the Discord, right? Yeah, we've got a few questions here from, the, can I first say that that is freaking awesome. I think that's probably the most interesting and exciting thing I've seen at a ZCon to date. <laughs> this has been, um, you know, this, the, this work has been, has been a long time in the, in the development and um, it hit problems when Ledger decided that they you know, were going to insist that in order to accept the app uh, for even consideration on the Ledger, uh, you know, for adding to the Ledger device that they would need there to be a desktop wallet. Then there was a change of leadership at the foundation that uh, meant that nothing moved forward and you know, for that I take, I take full responsibility and then we ended up chatting to Juan at, uh, at, uh, at Zondax again and uh, you know, so talking about getting this integration done and now you know, I think the next step is going to be to see if we can, um, you know, if we can get this uh, added into um, the the mainstream version of Zekwalt Lite and hopefully, hopefully other wallets as well. But you know, the having having, you know, it's, it, this is not a simple task to take a take a device that has got very limited capability, very limited computing power, very limited uh, memory, and to be able to get this get this working on it. So you know, again, just another big personal round of applause from me for the Zondax team for 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 achieving this because. This Thank is, uh, this is, this is uh, you know, big. And it's, and it's been really interesting, you know, listening to, to the problems that you've encountered, you know, um, you know for example, um, you know, running into problems with uh, not being able to, to access a testnet like WalletD, like that, there's some learnings for, for, for us and I think, uh, you know, to, 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 to take away from that about the sort of support that we need to provide to uh, other development teams that want to take part in the Zcash ecosystem because you know, I'm sure it was a very frustrating experience for Zontax to do that. Um, have you um, looked at uh, uh, Hans WarpSync uh, capability? I'm not sure this is actually relevant to, 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 to this, so I'm, I'm gonna move on. Um, the, the implementation that you've done, that's using the, the Zekwad Lite um, uh, or a fork of the Zekwad Lite CLI, is that correct? And yeah. then in, in order to get that uh, integrated into into the main app, it'll need to be there needs to be a you know kind of merged into uh, into the main app by 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 Aditya, yeah. Yeah, that's um, that's right. It's a for it's the fork with uh, cherry pick for some partial support, uh, but eventually we aim to um, integrate it with Aditya's work. But yes, it's the fork of his work, and um, actually. There was something here in the question that uh, I wanted to, yeah, it's an old version. It's like a few months old with uh, the latest, uh, some of the latest commits. That's the cherry pick part. But yeah, it's his work. And you mentioned also uh, Y Wallet. Uh, I wanted to mention it earlier, but uh, sorry, I forgot. Uh, y Wallet already had released a, a somewhat of an integration with the ledger. Uh, Han has said that it's not in production, but the code is there on the Git on GitHub, and because he couldn't fit the app on the Nano S, as we saw earlier, he couldn't test it on a device, so he had a different approach on the integration using the emulator, but he did the integration work with, his, with the Y Wallet, so it, it is supported, it's not in production, you should reach out if you use Y Wallet, and as far as WarpSync goes, we, it's not relevant in our case, I have looked at it, but it's not what, I mean, it would have sped up probably syncing, but if we had, if we wanted to use Warps, Warp Sync, we'll have to change how Light Wallet, oh, sorry, how Zek Wallet Light syncs, which is a whole other beast altogether, and we just decided not to go for it this time. Can everything be done with the Zek Wallet Light CLI, or does it require the, yes. the GUI interface? Okay. Uh, actually, if we are to look at how it's done, the integration is done in the lib part, so every user that makes use of the lib library can make use of this integration. The CLI uses the library as well, and the GUI also uses the library. So if you have built a wallet that uses the library, you can make use of this work as well. 
where was the NU5 parsing code cherry picked from? Um, we actually, since the, the parsing would have been done for the ledger, not necessarily for the wallet, so we actually didn't parse and we didn't pick, cherry pick any parsing. Uh, what would we need to do to be able to support Nano X through Bluetooth for mobile wallets? Um, I mean, the Bluetooth part in the wallet in the Ledger apps is done somewhat transparent to what the wallet, no, sorry, what the app actually is doing. Like it's just a mode of transport for data like USB is. So as of now, it should be supported, but um, we can't test it. The Nano X doesn't allow side loading unsigned apps, which in our case it would be not signed by Ledger, so it would need to be side loaded, so we can test it. We can test it with the emulator, but you know, emulator is not the real thing and it's not Bluetooth and it's not USB. So for that, you will need to ask Ledger when the submission is made for, and they accept it to test it and stuff. Can the host be a mobile phone or a Zcash D, or is there something special about the Zek Wallet Lite desktop version? I haven't investigated it, honestly. Uh, we, as you saw, the time was very tight to actually get it to work, so it's something that you could definitely investigate, I mean, if you use the library, but also the process is, it's just a bunch of steps, but overall, it's simple, right? It's just getting it in the right code base, in the right form, so that it's compatible, it doesn't leak uh, water everywhere, to say. But we haven't investigated it, what, the back end, we just, went with what was most available and used already. Okay. Um, another question, is there a timeline for Orchard transaction support? I think the short answer to that is, is not yet, but is, it, is, it, is Orchard transaction support something that you could see being possible using, using this approach and using the same, the same sort of uh, architecture and framework? I mean, we haven't investigated much because we need to see with the foundation, but it's something that we would like to do. Uh, but we haven't investigated, uh, we haven't spent time, especially because it was closed again, sorry, but we haven't spent much time looking at how we can accomplish, but the way the, I understand the protocol and the way I understand the Ledger app works, it wouldn't be something impossible. Like, we, we can definitely make something happen. Uh, somebody has asked, would you be interested in pairing with the ECC core team and wallet team for a mobile wallet integration? Personally, yeah, I don't see why we couldn't pair up and I mean it would allow us to probably make a better or a more um, smooth integration both on our on the development side but also on the user side so that maybe they can have with the Nano X Bluetooth or with the OTG cable just connect and work, right? And this is a question from me and uh, and you know I, I I think it's a good opportunity to give some to give some really useful feedback, both to you know us at the foundation as the as the as the grant provider, and please do not you know pull your punches, and also to the Zcash community at large. You know, what has been the most frustrating or difficult aspects of this project for you guys, and what can the Zcash community do to make it easier for teams like you to do work like this in the future? I mean, honestly, the hardest part, I would say, was integrating something, like integrating the software that wasn't, was never meant to be modular, which was, it's just the specific of the code base. Like, it was never meant, it's like a laptop, it was never meant to replace a CPU. So, making it actually work, and basically cutting off pieces and putting something else insta inside was the hardest part. But after that, I think maybe documentation on errors isn't exactly the clearest. It, I have to say though, could be definitely my fault, like I haven't looked at the right places. For example, I saw one of the first question was like, there is a publicly available testnet light wallet D server, I couldn't find it, but it could be that I didn't look hard enough or I didn't look in the right place. So the same could, ha could be for the errors that we encountered. To actually, me, when I searched the, where the error happens, I went to the ZcashD repo, I looked for the string, that was the error that I was getting, and I looked at where it was coming from. But that's 
the documentation I found. I found some post on the Zcash community forum, but it was most like you need to sync your, your node or you need to update it, but it doesn't really apply in our case. Okay, w would, it, would it help to have a, a forum that is um, dedicated to or more focused on um, developers working on projects like this where, where, where you could potentially talk directly to uh, engineers at the foundation and, and at TCC? I think that would be very helpful, yes, because if we have, what, what, from what I understand, you're talking some, something like a forum, but more developer-oriented or like a knowledge base, let's say, I don't know, a Zcash Stack Exchange, something like that, <laughs> right? So we could have very technical questions answered by the people that actually work on this stuff day to day. Yeah, that would definitely be more helpful for people like us. Okay. Something for us to take away and work on. Um, and uh, how do you export the FVK from the Ledger device for use by client software? That's actually a wonderful question because we don't. There is no, the Ledger doesn't allow you to export it. So actually the, the code was making use of the full viewing key and we had to refactor a bunch so that it would not, because it wasn't really necessary to use it. It was, it was being used to compute the nullifier, but that was replaced with just ask the Ledger. It was used to look up notes and stuff more easily, but the, what was really needed in that case was just the incoming viewing key. So we went ahead, refactored, how the, 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 node, the notes are stored in memory so that they only use the incoming viewing key instead of the full viewing key. And for the payment address, uh, it would include the diversifier, and that's what we do actually when we generate the address. We also retrieve the default diversifier. So all the information that was actually being used by the wallet is present. Everything else, that's also stuff that wasn't accessible to the ledger like that you couldn't get out of the ledger is not there and we don't ask it. Cool. So in that case, we don't export the full viewing key, yeah. Cool, that's all the questions we, oh, hang on, one last one. How would you feel about a monorepo so you always know where to look? <laughs> I mean, monorepos have their purpose. Uh, if, you, if you talk about a monorepo with Zcash D, Light Wallet D, Y Wallet and all the other wallets that exist and will ever exist, I don't think it's something feasible or it should be done, honestly. Uh, the projects are good the way they are isolated. The, it's just there is no um, knowledge base or connection for these kind of developer questions. Cool. We're going to leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much. And congratulations on a successful live demo. That was, uh, that was spectacular.